write science fiction for a living, and I guess I'm I'm here to share with you a master class in science fiction and how to write science fiction. It'll be mostly how to write, uh, but a little bit about science fiction. It'll all come together, uh, hopefully. Uh, anyway. Science fiction is a fairly big field. It's got a lot of different nooks and crannies. Uh, a lot of people know science fiction, but their definitions may vary. So let's find out what, in fact, is science fiction. Computer, what is science fiction? Science fiction is a genre of speculative fiction that typically deals with imaginative and futuristic concepts such as advanced science and technology, space exploration, time travel, parallel universes, and extraterrestrial life. It has been called the literature of ideas, and often explores the potential consequences of scientific, social, and technological innovations. That's actually a pretty good definition of science fiction. And... Here's something I found on the web. Computer, According stop. to Get Set... And that right there is a very science fiction thing. Not only having a computer that can actually talk to you, which when I was a kid was just, I mean, was science fiction, period. Uh, but having a computer that has got enough of a personality or will interrupt or do all of those things, uh, those are aspects of science fiction that we're having to deal with today. The definition I really like of science fiction is one that Alan Dean Foster came up with. He, he came up with it to differentiate between science fiction and fantasy. Alan said that science fiction was the fiction of the possible, whereas fantasy was a fiction of the impossible. I mean, no matter how much any of, it was, any of us would wish it, stuff that goes on in a fantasy novel it just can't happen in our world. But science fiction, it can. We can have machines that will end up talking to us. Uh, we can have uh, uh, people going to other planets. Um, we could have, well, depending upon who you believe when you look on the internet, we could have aliens visiting this world and inviting us uh, to join them. All sorts of different things that are possible within the realm of science fiction. Science fiction even has uh, a lot of subgenres of uh, military science fiction, steampunk, diesel punk, uh, cyberpunk, uh, hard SF, that's where you do all the math. Uh, social science fiction, where you're examining the impact of technology uh, on people and human nature and how we interact with that sort of stuff. There is space opera, there's space fantasy, there's alternate history, there are techno thrillers. I mean, that's right, you know, uh, uh, 20 years before Tom Clancy was Tom Clancy, if you had written a Tom Clancy novel, it would have been classified as science fiction. Now, eh, not so much. One of the things about science fiction that has sort of been endemic or, or a, a part of the fiber of science fiction uh, since its inception, because it's that science, it's the fiction or literature of ideas, is that technology and ideas would be involved in the solution of the particular problem. And you see that throughout science fiction in, in its beginnings, that there's a problem that's posed and it's solved by the introduction of technology. You also get, curiously enough, the reverse of that, where science creates the problem, and then a negation of that technology or a further development of that technology is in fact what goes ahead and, and solves uh, the particular problem. So science fiction is something that could happen today, and science fiction is something that uh, you expect technology to not only solve that particular problem, but also possibly set up a situation going forward uh, where that's going to have a lot of repercussions. So that's the general area that we've got science fiction. Um, and science fiction dates back, I mean, it depends upon who, uh, uh, who you want to look at as being the, the parents of science fiction. Uh, there was uh, a, a, an old Greek a story about a trip to the moon uh, from uh, uh, you know a couple centuries BCE. Um, uh, H.G. Wells certainly gets credited with a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, 
I think that uh, George Chetwin Griffiths uh, should be credited with a lot of stuff, and I know H.G. Wells would absolutely uh, hate that. Uh, but the fact is, is that there's a lot of utopian, a lot of voyaging uh, uh, fiction. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, could even generally apply to that field of science fiction. So it's been something with us uh, for a long time. And a lot of people go ahead and refer to it as speculative fiction because it's not real fiction. Uh, and, and that is how all of that uh, kind of get, uh, gets uh, lumped together. One of the things you need to understand about uh, science fiction is that uh, that science fiction is a marketing category. Uh, it's a convenient way to shelve all the books together uh, so that people who like to read science fiction, like to read fantasy, know exactly where to go sh to shop uh, in the bookstore. It really says nothing about its content, and science fiction is so buried, and elements of science fiction show up in so many places that uh, really the definition in terms of defining a literature doesn't really hold sway that much uh, anymore. Um, I remember when I was doing the Star Wars books, uh, the, the uh, Star Wars books were not considered science fiction. Uh, they were listed in a category all its own called blockbuster. Uh, and so that's, and it was entirely based on sales. But none of the Star Wars books would be seen as being in a, in a publisher's science fiction list uh, per se. They were something else that was separate. One thing that's cool about science fiction is that it has built up its own lexicon and its own sort of stable of concepts that we're all free to use. And, you know, a big one is faster than light travel. Uh, and you see that, I mean, Star Trek and Star Wars, you have hyperspace or you have warp space, you have uh, these drives that rip a hole in the fabric of reality and you move from one point uh, to another either instantaneously or they take a certain amount of time. That idea of being able to travel between stars is really, really important. It's, it's what makes science fiction uh, what it is when you're looking at the space opera and, and the frontier novels. You know, again, as, as it gets referred to in Star Trek, uh, space is the final frontier. Um, I would argue uh, this whole frontier mentality is one of the reasons why science fiction is a quintessentially uh, American uh, form of literature, because American uh, literature, especially as the country was starting out, uh, dealt uh, very often with themes of the frontier. Uh, the idea in American literature where no matter who you were, whether it was in, in England or in Europe or on the East Coast, uh, no matter who you were and what you did, you could always move to the frontier. You could always push it further. You could always explore. And that whole exploration uh, is a part of science fiction, which is really, really cool. Um, John Updike, in, uh, in talking about science fiction, once noted that uh, approximately 25% of any science fiction novel goes to world building, goes to setting up the rules that define the playground where this particular story is going to uh, take place. Uh, Updike maintained that it was this additional 25% of words in science fiction novels uh, and the way that they were employed uh, to create a world that made science fiction largely impenetrable to the average reader, uh, to literary readers or readers who are not uh, comfortable with uh, being so far away from reality as readers of science fiction and fantasy uh, very much are. Um, other things that are conventions that we see in science fiction, uh, aliens, you know, the idea that there are other civilizations, that there are other uh, peoples out there uh, that might visit us and inter interact with us. Um, energy weapons, uh, you know, the phasers and, and uh, 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 lightsabers and Nissan cannons and, and all of those things. Uh, those are part and parcel of science fiction these days. Uh, genetic engineering and body modification. Uh, cyborgs. Uh, the fact that, you know, a union of man and machine, what does that mean? Uh, how does that, how do characters deal with that? Uh, that's uh, very much a part and parcel of science fiction, and we see that uh, being used all, the different, all, all over the place. Artificial intelligence. Again, you know, uh, 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 Alexa may not, in fact, be uh, artificially intelligent, but there's enough brain power there pushing words down through a pipe uh, to answer us that it seems like there's uh, artificial intelligence. 
So science fiction is big. It's a varied field. It's a field that uh, really welcomes imagination. And uh, I think we'll move from here into uh, trying to show you actually how to uh, start writing it. So, you know, this is your first step into writing. Uh, and, and remember, writing is the OG social distancing uh, career. Uh, and this is the place where you work alone, you talk to pretty much nobody other than yourself or these characters locked away in your head, um, and you get paid for it as opposed to getting locked up. Uh, so science fiction and, and writing, uh, I'll give you some, some basic rules. I mean, it would take hours and hours. I mean, literally, there are YouTube channels, uh, and there will be more YouTube channels devoted to how do you go ahead and write. But let me run down through some basics here of, of key things that you absolutely have to do if you're going to write science fiction or you're going to write anything else. First of all, uh, you have to read whatever it is that you write. You really just have to read. Um, we learn how to write based on how other authors communicate to us. We see their words, we see their techniques, and we learn how to adapt those uh, ourselves to what we're doing. Uh, for example, I know uh, because when I was uh, much, much younger, uh, I had a, a fairly steady diet of Edgar Rice Burroughs books. I learned how to plot uh, from Edgar Rice Burroughs. I have used his style of plotting uh, in a number of novels. It has served me very, very well and, and continues to work uh, for yet other writers. Uh, and this is stuff that literally is, you know, these techniques are techniques that are over a century old. Uh, so I've learned from him. He obviously learned from other writers uh, and, uh, and, and writers like, and I'm sure there are writers who've learned from me, uh, realizing that it's a Burroughs technique, uh, which went back to Chetwin Griffiths or went back to a, a, lot, of other, uh, a lot of other writers um, and is brought forward. You want to read, again, in depth because you want to know what goes on in your field. You want to know what other people have done just so you know what ground has already been trod and, and where you might find new ideas to go ahead and play with. You want to read broadly, because you may only want to write military science fiction, but the fact is, is that, that AI and how people write about AI may come to play in your science fiction novel, or in your military science fiction novel, you may have extraterrestrials, you may have other civilizations, and how other people have introduced them, how other people have written about them, may inform what you're going to go ahead and do. Lastly, I think you want to write, or excuse me, you want to read critically. And, and the way I would encourage you to do that is this. Take any book that you're going to read for fun, that you're just going to read for enjoyment, and keep a notebook with you as you read it. And at the end of each chapter, take a minute, no more than two minutes, to jot down any interesting ideas or any sparks or any questions uh, that you had that occurred during that chapter. You might you might write down, hey, I really liked how this writer wrote that particular uh, uh, chapter. I really uh, like how they introduced characters. I liked the twist at the end of the chapter. I liked all of these different things. Um, that's something that uh, you then will do at the end of each chapter. At the end of the book, you're going to come back and you're going to reread your notes. And if you find something where you really liked how somebody introduced a character, reread that passage a bunch of times. Take a look at it. Figure out what the author did to introduce that character, and then figure out how you can go ahead and use that in your writing. That's not plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you steal somebody else's work word by word and, and claim it your own. That's bad. Don't do that. This is more learning by watching someone else do it. Same way you might learn how to play golf by watching tapes of someone else uh, hitting drives or putting. You're never going to be able to hit that same stroke. You're ne never going to be able to steal their swing. But you may notice things that they do that can later help you do something. So that's why you read critically. And that's why it's important to be mindful about that and analyze that stuff and figure out because if you can see how someone else did it if you figure out how you can do it you can do that more than once and you can do variations off that uh, as you go forward so that's point one 
read broadly, read critically, learn how other people write. Second thing you have to do, and this is really important, and this is probably the most difficult one, you actually have to sit down and write. Look, I know that you're trapped, you're cooped up with other people in your house, uh, in your apartment, wherever you are, and it's tough to get a little alone time, get a little space uh, to be able to write things down, but you can do that. I mean, one, if you're trapped with other people, they're going to be as sick of you as you are of them. So getting a little alone time, going to neutral corners, uh, and doing whatever it is you want to do uh, is a great idea. Writing really boils down to accreting words, just letting words pile up. So if you get to jot down 10 words here or a paragraph there or a page there, that's great because after a certain amount of time, you will have a finished product. You know, as, as, as farmers were want, wants to say, once want to say, no field ever got plowed by turning it over in your mind. You can think about a story. You can think about all the cool ideas and things you would like to do. Let's just sit down and do them. It's never going to get done. Uh, not a single writer, I, I, there's no writer I know who has not had someone come up to them and say, hey, I've got a great idea. So why don't you write the story and we'll split the money 50-50. When people say that to me, my response to them is always, I tell you what, why don't you write it and just pay me 25%? Think about it. it. It will make sense. Sitting down and writing is the hard part of the job. Coming up with ideas is easy. And that's where you earn your money, by actually sitting down and writing. So, if you're going to be a writer, sit down and write. Third thing, characters. Characters are, characters are it. If you can write good characters, characters who are emotionally engaging, you've got a career. You can do anything. Uh, you will have readers because they will find your characters interesting and fascinating and engaging. Characters have to be emotionally reactive. There has to be a way to engage with them, to hook into them, to, to find something which is interesting. Uh, we could easily describe probably half the human population by saying they were average height, brown hair, brown eyes. But it's when you add another detail, something that isn't a physical detail, that they become emotionally, uh, emotionally charged, emotionally reactive. So let's say you're describing a woman and you say she's average height and she has black hair and she has brown eyes. And she always has that little smile as if she's got a secret. Well, that little detail right there, all of you listening to this, you're thinking about, what does that smile look like? Does she have a secret? Is that smile pasted on there to cover the fact that her secret is very tragic? Or is she scheming and she can barely conceal that smile because of what she knows that the other people don't know? Well, the fact that we can start asking those questions is important because it gets us emotionally invested in that character. And face it, once you have an emotional landscape for a character, they become real. Because in our memory, our friends are not just height, eye color, hair color. They're also how they make us feel. They're the memories that we have. And so, and, the, and those, I mean, real people live in our brains because they've got all those details. Well, when you take a character in your story and you give them all those details, that character becomes just as real. And then anything you do with that character, if they have a great victory, your reader will celebrate it. If the character dies, your reader will mourn. And that's what you want. So you want characters who are going to be emotionally reactive and, and draw the reader in and engage the reader. So that's really important. Second thing about characters, which is really important, is you have to give them serious challenges. All right, you know, challenging a character where there are six bad guys and the gun has only got five bullets, that's not a challenge, that is a math problem. And you, you already know that there's been a 900 stories written where that same problem was posited, and the solution is you shift around until two guys are lined up and you kill two of them with one bullet. 
I mean, we all know that that's how it works, right? So that story's been written. Uh, you want to give real challenges. You want to have things that, that make uh, readers fear for the characters, make them feel for the characters. You know, you want to have a, a, a character who's a doctor and, and during a terrible, uh, a terrible illness, a grandfather brings a grandchild uh, into the emergency room and says, help us, help us. And you as the doctor know the chances of that child living are, are relatively slender. And the grandfather probably could live. Okay, if he was on a ventilator. The kid will definitely die without a ventilator. The grandfather probably is not going to fare too well if he's not on a ventilator. But you as a doctor, now I've got to choose. Do I kill the old man who's more likely to survive? Or do I kill this child who isn't? And does the doctor even view it as, am I killing them or am I saving them? How the doctor, you know, situates the problem really determines a lot about that character. And again, whether or not they're going to be emotionally engaging, whether or not they're going to be something that, that readers want to continue to read about. You have to give them hard choices. Readers, one of the one of the worst things, excuse me, a writer can do is that they can fall in love with a character so that they won't give them the hard choices, so that they won't threaten them with death, so that they might not kill them. Look, in, in countless books, I've killed characters. Uh, to, to many readers, uh, anger, upset, dismay, and, and sadness. And in a situation where I've got four or five characters, any one of them who could die, and I have to choose one because I know in this book, at this point, one of these characters has got to die because, you know, it's a disaster and not everybody can make it out. When I have to choose one of those characters, I pick the character I like the most. And I do that because if I kill that character... It's going to hurt me the most, and I know it's going to hurt the reader the most. So you have to be prepared to, to put characters in difficult situations that are more than math problems, that are more than one gimmick away, that have got emotional consequence. consequence. And even after they make a decision, when they choose the grandchild or the grandfather, the repercussions of that it's going to be something emotionally that they continue to deal with throughout the rest of the story. So it's really important that you, you have to be hard on your characters. It's hard as you can possibly be. Because that makes the stories real and that gives the reader, uh, it takes the reader on an emotional roller coaster. And that's really what we're reading all of this stuff for. Next thing you have to do in science fiction, this is really, really important, is you have to do consequence testing. Any decision you make, especially when it comes to world design, you have to look at and make sure it can't be misused or that it doesn't have unintended consequences. Let's take a look at, at, at replicator technology out of Star Trek for as a wonderful example. It started with the transporter, which was great to get uh, uh, characters from point A to point B, that was brilliant. But once we suddenly turned it over into, we can transform uh, energy into matter to produce anything, from food to anything, suddenly there are problems with the world. This only works if you have unlimited power. So where do they get all that energy? Where do they get all that energy on a starship? So, so that's a problem. Two, if the replicator can replicate anything, you have no economy because nothing has value. What value does a diamond have? Which really, diamonds being carbon, which is fairly common, they really don't have uh, any value except that there are cartels that force it. But the point being, if I have a replicator, I don't care. You know, Costume jewelry suddenly is not costume jewelry because you can have actual sapphires and diamonds and all of those things in your costume jewelry. It will look that much better and everybody can have it. Everybody's a tycoon. Or how does that get limited? You know, in a world like that, 
you know, in, in Star Trek world, is Jean Luc Picard the the wine that Jean Luc Picard makes uh, on his estate? Is that valuable because a replicator can't give you the exact same thing? Is there, you know, do we need a certain amount of raw material that goes in before we can get the stuff out? What does it, is, is there a thriving, I mean, literally, uh, how do you tell the difference between an original Picasso and a replicated Picasso? What is that going to do to all the art thieves in the world and all the forgers? A lot of questions that they didn't examine, and yet those questions are the questions that we can examine and actually tell some interesting stories about. But anything you posit, just go through and make sure that uh, how it works is, is functional, that it doesn't just break down. Uh, because you want your world to be believable. Again, as Updike said, you've got that 25% of your story to create a believable world. Do that. Especially because science fiction readers live for that stuff. Uh, you know, Updike sees the 25% as a barrier to people getting in. Heck, most science fiction readers, that 25% and that whole sense of discovery is what they live for. That's what they read for. And so you want to make sure to, to be able to get that right. Consequence testing. Figure out the best case, what are the cool things we can do with this, and then figure out how it could be horribly misused. And and those are the things that you've got to examine as you as you uh, as you go forward. Next thing, if you're going to be writing, is this: just keep going. Do not revise as you go along. Uh, again, every writer I know has had someone come up to them. Uh, and, and say, I'm working on a novel, I have done the first chapter, I've done 24 drafts of the first chapter, and it is perfect. You know, what should I do from now? Uh, what should I do going forward? Finish the damn book is what you got to do. You as a writer have a choice. You can have one chapter that you've gone over 24 times, and you've made it perfect. Or you can have 24 imperfect chapters. And ask yourself, which is closer to having a novel? 24 imperfect chapters or one perfect chapter? And that's actually kind of a trick question because the end of a novel determines where the novel begins. So what you write to complete the story, the problem you resolve in the end of the story, is the problem you've got to make sure the story starts with. And more often than not, especially with your first novel, it may begin three chapters in. So your perfect chapter just is never going to show up. Or it may begin three chapters even earlier than that. So your perfect chapter is going to be just lost in the middle. If you revise as you go, you will never finish a novel. Just make notes. I mean, literally, in, in, in all of my books, I, I use notebooks. Just like this, I keep notes as I'm going. Uh, I make notes in, in between revisions, and uh, and in between revisions, doing revisions, in between drafts, I make the book better. And you have that chance to do it. You don't have to get it perfect the first time. One of the other problems a lot of people talk about, they'll say, how do you turn the editor off in your head? So this is the way you do that. Tell the editor in your head to stop. Because... Editors don't write. Editors are supposed to tell writers what to do. So you, the writer, have just got to get all the words out there, and then you, the editor, will go ahead and tell the writer how to fix all of those things. So tell the editor to shut up. It does not matter whether the word you want to use is scarlet or crimson or red or blood red. You can figure that out later. All that's important is it's a shade of red. Keep going. That's the way you get to the end of the book. And here's the key thing about, about writing. Novelists are the only people who can fix novels. Just by getting to the end of the book, you've developed skills that will allow you to fix your book, allow you to make your book better. You have that experience. Chapterists, the guys with the perfect chapter, chapterists, 
just don't exist. There is no market for chapters. They don't know anything about doing a novel. Get to the end of the novel, and you can do it. Just let the words pile up. You keep your notes. If you happen, and this is another thing that happens, let's say first six chapters you've decided your main character is an orphan, and then in chapter seven you decide, no, you know, it would be really good if he had a grandfather who was in an old folks home and was cantankerous and was a problem. Do not go back and rewrite the first six chapters. Just from chapter seven, start writing as if the grandfather had already been there. You know, make a note on page one saying, uh, yeah, put granddad in. Because what you're going to find is this. If you go back and rewrite now, you're going to put in far too much stuff about the grandfather. It may be, in fact, that you don't need to mention the grandfather at all in those first six chapters. Or, you know, in chapter four, the only mention that even hints at the grandfather is, uh, I looked at my uh, missed calls, and there was one from the rest home. I didn't have to deal with that now. All right. That lets people know something's going on there. And then when the grandfather turns out to be cantankerous and a problem, then it all makes sense. So don't worry about doing that, uh, doing rewrites as you go. That's not the way to do it. Do the drafts when you're done. That way you'll know what you're fixing and you've developed those skills. Where do you get your ideas? This is point six. Where do you get your ideas? Every runner I know is it gets asked by people, where do you get your ideas? Because they're so wild and they're so different, which they aren't really. But we get our ideas by asking, what if? So you look at any ordinary situation and you say, what if? Let's take the, the, the COVID-19 virus. What if having the virus turned your skin a shade of green? And the deeper, darker, the more all of the green, the more you look like a, a toy army soldier, the more virulent your bit of the, uh, uh, your strain of the virus was. So that if you, you know, and if you, again, look like an army man, an army, a plastic army man, you know, you are typhoid Mary. And yet, even if you only have a little bit of color to you, what would happen in society? Would people avoid you? I mean, I damn straight sure, we basically all know that right now, everybody who is olive green would be being rounded up and herded onto an island or herded into a town that's been, you know, deserted. They would be wrapped up, put in internment camps so they couldn't infect anybody else. We know that would be what would actually go on. But what would be the lasting a legacy of that. How would it affect society? That's a what-if question uh, that we get to look at. So take any situation you can see and just say, what if? How would I change this? The other thing is, you'll notice that, that you know, in talking about COVID virus turning people various shades of green, an obvious analog is with race relations in the country race relations in the world. So that through the lens of COVID-19 or another uh, disease that you posit happening in the world, you could go ahead and examine racism. You could have people have to deal with their beliefs. And, and that allows readers to think about what they think, to challenge their beliefs, to see how other people think to revise what they're thinking or to, 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 to reinforce uh, what they think. And that's one of the strengths. I think Updike Up does not get that about science fiction, is we get a chance to look at the human condition from a distant perspective. And that puts us in a position to make some judgments where we're not necessarily tied too tightly to what we think. We're given some distance. That allows us to, gives us a safe space to rethink stuff. So, what if is going to be your core for finding ideas? And just depending on how complex your story is, that's how many ideas and how many what ifs that you toss in there. And always remember to include the emotional content, the emotional impact, because that's what will keep your readers engaged. Uh, that'll give added dimension to the story. That'll make the story real.
right? So what if is your friend? And look, you know, every writer, again, every writer I know keeps a notebook. Uh, you know, we write down what if things on a fairly constant basis. That doesn't mean every idea is going to be golden. I mean, a lot of them aren't. Or they aren't right at the moment, and then later on you find a place to use them. But keeping track of those ideas, you know, asking yourself those questions, getting used to that, is the way you learn to generate generate ideas and actually be able to, to turn out stories on a, on a fairly consistent basis. Here's the last thing. Here's point seven. You can actually do this. Okay? Writing science fiction, writing anything, is not rocket surgery. You don't have to be a genius to do it. I know a lot of writers who are geniuses, and I know even more writers who are not geniuses. All that's important is that you're willing to take a chance to put your ideas down. And look, there are going to be people who hate what you do just because it's been done. I remember, uh, this was back, this was 20 years ago, uh, when uh, my last, one of my last Star Wars books was coming out, uh, Ice Arch Revenge. And uh, I looked at, I, was, Amazon was in its, in its early days, uh, and I looked at the Amazon review for uh, Ice Arch Revenge, and this was before the book came out. This was before there were review copies out of the book. I literally had just turned the manuscript in. But it already had a page, and there already was a review for the book. And I mean, aside from the Lucasfilm, and aside from, from Venom staff and myself, nobody had read this book. And the review was a one-star review, and I... I the opening line of that review was, Oh no, oh God no, not another Stackpole novel. It is so hateful, it is wonderful and delicious. So just understand that, that with, no matter what you do, okay, someone will hate it. Just accept that as given, and if you're lucky, they will be creative enough to give you a laugh about it. You should write the stories that you want to read. You should write the stories that would entertain you. And just trust that there are enough people out there who have got to share enough sensibilities with you that they will enjoy those stories too. And I, and I tell you, vast majority of people who uh, have those stories uh, and, and like your stories, you will never hear from them. Never, ever. But occasionally, you'll get a, you'll get a letter from somebody uh, and they'll say, you know, your book was the first book I ever read for pleasure. It was the first book I read since I've gotten out of high school. Or your book was a book that got me through a really hard time. And, and, and letters like that, that makes up for everything else. And really, it really tells you why you're doing what you're doing. So you can do this. Just pile those words up. When you're not writing, spend time reading. Spend time exploring. Expand your mind. Ask what if. And you can actually do this. And, you know, a month from now, Five months from now, a year from now, you could actually have a finished book. And then you'll be ready uh, because you'll be a totally trained writer uh, for the next um, a horrible disease that we have come along. Uh, and you'll be able to work from home. It'll be great. So thank you very much. I, I really hope this uh, helps you get through uh, being stir-crazy uh, and having to sit at home. Uh, this was great fun, and uh, please, good luck with your writing, and, uh, and, and I look forward to being able to read your story someday. Thank you.